folks uh, welcome to this uh, exciting panel i think this is a this is an area where which is very little uh, you know the oil and gas uh, you know sector is one of the biggest buyers of technology and yet there is very little understanding of that in silicon valley so this is uh, this is and one of the reasons that we have very little understanding is that there is no one is to bridge the gap you see between technology and and what silicon valley does and what oil and gas industry needs so you know i think the one of the one of the positive developments that has taken place is over the last uh, couple of years that uh, we have a charter member now in our ranks who who works in oil and gas industry but uh, has the dna of uh, you know of uh, of technology he used to be a technologist before uh, before he joined uh, uh, this industry as a senior executive and he has been sent to silicon valley to be the so with the eyes and ears you see for his company in terms of uh, what is cutting edge technology that could be useful so i'm i'm uh, so you know it's my pleasure it's my honor to introduce the moderator of this panel uh, sami haroon he is a charter member and uh, and with baker hughes so sami please Thank you for that uh, very gracious uh, introduction. Uh, one of the things is my son, 11-year-old son, is here, and he reminded me that on my bio it says I live in Houston. Actually, I've been here for a year and a half, and I am a charter member with Silicon Valley. Uh, folks, let me go ahead and get the structure laid out as to how the panel is going to work, and uh, then I will have a short introduction to highlight to you some of the specifics around oil and gas. Uh, that introduction will be followed by. Uh, my introduction of a panelist who will take about two, three, four minutes to highlight to you opportunity areas inside of oil and gas, and then I will introduce the next panelist. After that, I will conduct a Q&A, and this Q&A will go for, uh, each answer will be about three minutes or so. Uh, at the end, I will have some rapid fire questions. When I see you guys nodding off, I will have some rapid fire questions for you guys, and these folks will be sticking around to uh, spend some time with you. But prior to starting, number one, I want to thank Baker Hughes and Ty Houston for sponsoring this and trying to bring this to light to Silicon Valley, which uh, is slowly gaining momentum. Folks, there is what I call a quiet revolution of technology taking place in oil and gas. And while there are entrepreneurs who say, my market is this many trillion, let me inform you that oil and gas spent 1.1 trillion in 2015 overall. It is so real, I hope that it starts to gain more and more traction here. Uh, one of the things I also want to highlight, of interest to anyone, either venture or entrepreneurs, Ty Houston has begun, with the help of Ty Silicon Valley, uh, Energy SIG, a special interest group where some of the, the top companies are engaged, venture capitalists are engaged, so we would like to have you connect into it. Please drop your business card at the bowl, which is sitting at the back of the room if you have to leave early. With that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Ricardo Angel first. Ricardo is a managing director at Energy Ventures, which he leads uh, for uh, the, it's Energy Technology Ventures, which is formed by GE, NRG Energy, and ConocoPhillips. They are focused on emerging energy technologies and Ricardo shared with me that uh, it's very opportunistic. Where is the value? So he will talk more about that. Previously, he was with Goldman Sachs. Uh, he has received his MBA from Northwestern University uh, as a Kellogg School. But he has his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate in engineering from University of Illinois. Uh, Ricardo lives in San Francisco. Ricardo, two to three minutes. What's top of mind? And I have a little trick question. Take a term from oil and gas and maybe perhaps explain it very shortly, which is a key metric in evaluating before an investment is made. Interesting, okay. So good morning, Ricardo Angel, as Sammy mentioned, uh, originally from Colombia, that's uh, the accent. Um, so I'm a managing director with GE Ventures and one of the vehicles for investment that we use is energy technology ventures, as, as Sammy mentioned. And so within GE Ventures, just to describe it very briefly, 
Um, GE Ventures is, is intended to be a, one of the growth engines for GE. We're a growth engine for innovation, through innovation. So what we do is we look to be able to access breakthrough technologies, business models, and solutions that we can then partner with and be able to scale them up and, uh, and take, it to, take them to market. And so um, GE Ventures on the VC side, we, we actually tackle a number of different segments. We, we go after energy, healthcare, IoT, and advanced manufacturing. So thinking about energy, we do invest mo both on the power side, renewables, we, lo we invest in smart grid and, um, and other areas like that, and also, of course, in oil and gas, which is the relevant part here. Within oil and gas, this is an area that we think can definitely benefit from a number of different IoT applications and IoT type of solutions, software-based type of solutions. And they can, really be, they, they can really be everywhere. They can be everywhere in terms of simply connecting your assets in the field to be able to then monitor them, be able to analyze them, be able to develop some predictive analytics, and at the end of the day, be able to optimize your, your overall operations. And even though this is a multi trillion dollar business, as Sammy mentions, uh, you'll be amazed in terms of the level of technology that you actually see in the field in Texas, in North Dakota, and other places. And so, you know, um, we, uh, we can definitely dig into that in more detail. At a high level, what I would say is that through software, through IoT, the three key elements that, that we definitely focus on uh, when you think about assets are availability, reliability, and, um, and um, performance. Thank you very much. Uh, next one, uh, good friend, uh, Shantanu Agarwal, uh, also uh, he is located in Houston. Shantanu is a partner at Energy Ventures. Energy Ventures is a leading oil and gas focused uh, venture capital growth capital firm. Energy Venture is about three, of, three and a quarter billion dollars. And one of the rare things about Energy Ventures is they, the last I remember is 34 investments, 17 successful exits. I, I haven't heard that track record before, Shantanu. All right. Uh, now, Shantanu, it is not on his profile, but I like to tell you is Shantanu is an IIT graduate who also went to Harvard and went to MIT to do a startup, which is OSCOM, which was then became uh, something that Energy Ventures invested in, and that's how he ended up being a partner there. Nonstop, can't, can't just uh, always, always on the edge. So one of the more interesting questions we are going to have for Shantanu is, what is the oil price at which he designs his investments? Because every time I call him, I said, why is it moving up? Why is it moving down? Where is it going to stop? So, <laughs> Thanks, Sammy. Thanks for that introduction. So, uh, well, the oil price question, that is a... A billion trillion dollar question, actually. If I knew where the oil price is going to be, I would, I would be hedging it and making a lot of money on that. But the, the macros of oil price right now, it's sitting at 60 today. If you look at um, the global picture, the, the oil price is defined or uh, set up based on demand and supply, as we all think. But it is also dependent on a lot of geopolitics. And a lot of geopolitical factors affect how that demand and supply plays. So for example, the oil price was sitting at 40, and for no real particular reason, it has creeped up to 60 right now. If you look at the, uh, look at the supply picture right now, we are producing the maximum amount of oil ever in US. We are producing about 9.3 million barrels a day today, even with the rig count at, the, at kind of the lowest it has been for a while. Our storage capacity is the maximum in May 2015 right now. It's at four, 480 million barrels. One and a half years of oil is sitting in US. Uh, one and a half years of production is sitting in U.S. stored, the maximum it has ever been. So why is the oil price creeping up to 60? Well, the reason is that uh, Saudi woke up one day and said, today I'm not going to sell it at 40 and I'm going to sell it at 45. And then everybody accepted that price and that became the new price. So there is a little bit of, uh, little bit of geopolitics here. There is a little bit of uh, mechanics on who are the main um, OPEC price leaders here. So uh, when I designed my... Um, uh, the question which Sami has, when I design my investment thesis, how do I think about oil price? The next few years are going to be much more volatile. And that's the fact of the matter, which you have to live with. Now, volatility means that uh, the oil price can creep up and can go up. And there can be shocks, uh, which will result in a sudden oil price spike. 
and that could be a war uh, with uh, Iraq and a war which is already going on, or some kind of a supply constraint, or there could be a sudden drop as well, where if, uh, if Iran comes on and suddenly starts pushing two and a half million barrels a day, which it is capable of, then the oil price can drop substantially as well. So it's a volatile mechanics which is uh, gonna be in play. It is different from the last 10 years where the basic geopolitical features of the oil, pro oil um, economy were much more stable. And uh, so we have to learn to live in the next 10 years and invest in the next 10 years. Well, thank you very much. They're, this is a very honest crowd. They'll tell you what they feel. All right, with that, thank you, Shantanun. Issam Dairani is uh, currently a leading, uh, manages a portfolio which is about 220 million. A uh, specific goal is creating financial and strategic value. So one of the things that uh, we are going to get a clarification on, one of the questions that we'll have is, what does strategic mean to the venture folks who are here? Uh, Isam serves on the board of five portfolio companies, either as a director or, or an observer. He's also co-director of BP Mist Technology Accelerator in Abu Dhabi. Isam has been with BP for 17 years, and uh, he had his uh, undergraduate degrees in chemistry and chemical engineering. Uh, he completed his PhD at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and uh, a number of executive courses at Imperial College, UC Berkeley, and Harvard. With that, Sam, just top of mind, and one one factor that you use in deciding the investment. Thank you, Sammy. Um, so uh, BP Ventures uh, has been investing since 2007, and we've gone through really three phases. Phase one is 2007 through 2010, in which we invested exclusively in clean tech. So this is all alternative energy investments, including energy efficiency. And uh, 2011 through 2014 is when we focused on uh, oil and gas. So we moved from uh, what we call alternative energy to an all energy fund, meaning that we do things in chemicals, in refining, as well as in, in, in upstream and midstream. Uh, phase three for us is really digital applications in energy. So this is 2015, and we have started doing some work in this, and we've done a couple of investments that I can share with you in this space, but we expect that the bulk of what we will be doing uh, going forward actually is in the digital space. And when you talk about digital space, I, th I think you really need to explain a little bit what do we mean by that. And if you think about all stages of oil exploration, through production, you'll see that you'll need to learn a lot about different aspects of the reservoir. So how do you really uh, understand exactly what is happening there? So what kind of sensors do you need to have to understand what is flowing, what is not flowing? And then as you start constructing, then you'll have to have all kinds of smart systems. And again, I'm using the IoT nomenclature here where you have these pipes that were dumb at one point and now they are really smart in the sense that they know if there is a breach, they know that there's gas is coming, they know if cement is, 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 is no longer doing its job and so on, and all the way through the production cycle. Um, for us, uh, when we talk about uh, strategic investments, what we're talking about here are things that BP is going to deploy. So we do not invest in things because we want to progress that technology per se. We do it only if we are going to use it. And the ma major criteria that we use in our investment is, apart from the two important elements that it should have, which is strategic and financial returns, is, is that our ability to accelerate the development. If we do not see that, then we do not invest. If the company is going, if the technology is going to be available anyway, then we do not participate. Only if we can uh, positively in, impact the, the, the development of the technology, then we put in some money in. in well, thank you very much. Next up is good friend, Kamal, who was the entrepreneur of the year, Ernest Young, <laughs> uh, entrepreneur of the year in 2011, has had a substantial exit of one of his companies, Merrick, to P2. It's difficult to explain Kamal, but he, he's uh, it's pretty much one of your hardcore entrepreneurs who takes an opportunity but does not deploy it. He sees it through and through. 
So just a little bit about him, what he's doing today is he's the CV, CEO of Shiv Ohm Consultants, uh, the US leader in accounting services for oil and gas production, tax and royalty compliance, and the founder and CEO of Farid Ventures, an investment advisory firm which focuses on software and software-enabled services in energy industrial. Uh, he's an electrical and computer engineer from University of Texas in Austin and an entrepreneurship master's from MIT. As you can see, we have split our corporate venture folks, uh, Ricardo, Sam, and then Neil in the end, with an entrepreneur and another entrepreneur who's running a venture fund. So Kamal, just a quick little what's top of mind. And you know, I call it, there's a quiet revolution of technology in oil and gas. And I was talking to Venk Shukla earlier, and it's like, there is so much opportunity. And I'm sorry, but we've got to tell the world about it. So with that. So when I look at where the oil and gas industry is going and all these issues with price volatility, what I need to look at are the short term and long term. Um, uh, impacts of, of what's going on. So in the short term, when prices are low, you have to operate uh, early stage ventures differently. They need to be, they need a little bit more capital because they're going to get sales more slowly and they're going to get uh, less uh, revenue per, per client because everybody's spending less. So you, you need to operate more efficiently. But whether or not to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur in oil and gas or invest in oil and gas, uh, early stage businesses, is a long term question. And the oil and gas industry globally produces over a thousand barrels a second of fluids that need to be taken to market. The demand for that globally, which is 70% of it is for transportation fuel, is going to grow. So in the long run, it, it is a very important industry for our civilization. It is fundamental to all other endeavors of mankind. And how can you solve problems of food and water and all of these things without that? So what are the problems that an oil and gas entrepreneur needs to solve? Well, there's three things. They need to decrease operating costs. They need to increase production rates, or they need to increase the total recoverables from the reservoir. And you do that through a variety of things. On the subsurface, you need to reduce subsurface uh, uncertainty and understand better what is going on below the surface through seismic, through interpretation, through big data. Uh, also, if you look at the subsurface plus the production system as a model, how do we better handle the uncertainty and how do we create better surface and subsurface coupled models so that we can optimize our uh, asset value over time and get more out of the ground. And then there are so many individual technologies to increase performance of total recovery, production rates, a lot of them now are, are, are heavily reliant on, uh, uh, on sensors and the models and digital technologies. And then with the new type of unconventional plays, we're having to break down the silos within the operating companies. Traditional resources, you can have exploration, drilling, and production is very much discontinuous processes that don't talk to each other that much. They sort of throw a big chunk of information uh, over the cubicle wall, and then the next phase begins. But unconventional is a continuous process of always improving. And there, we are very early still in uh, our technologies to characterize the subsurface and characterize how the fracture geometry affects production in the long run. So important. Uh, long term for our civilization, a lot of technology impact, a lot of opportunity. That's what I see. Thank you very much, Kamal. This will definitely be not the last or the least. We have Neil Dykman. Now, Neil is a senior venture principal with the venture capital arm of Royal Dutch Shell. Neil is originally from the Bay Area, has done no, no, nine stars. Originally from Houston. Houston. When I moved here for a decade, I never gave up my Texas driver's license. When I moved Last back home, but not the least, like when I, I moved said, back home to Houston, I never gave up my 415 area code. Right. <laughs> so we're anchored in two places, let's just say that. But the cool thing here for you guys is that he has done nine startups, and this is not a startup which is just North America bound. He's, he's done it across the globe. He is on the board of American Electric Technologies and GreenHome.com. Uh, not only the startup experience, uh, Prior to Shell, he, found, he was a founding partner at Energy Tech Merchant Bank, Jane Capital Partners, as many of you will know, uh, investing in energy, clean tech, and IT. As I spoke with uh, Neil, I understood that it's more advanced IT rather than commoditized IT, I would call it. 
he has incubated multiple companies and multiple and two IPOs are included in there. His repertoire is tremendous, uh, but what I will end with is he began his career in oil and gas investment banking at Bankers Trust and Deutsche Bank. He holds a BA from Texas A&M in economics. Neil, we're going to kick off Q&A with you as well. So first, oh, good. top of mind, number one, and number two, right off the bat, Silicon Valley, Houston, what are the big deltas, the gaps, and what are you doing about it? One of the reasons I moved back home from San Francisco to Houston was because you could see yeah, the valley was uh, reaching a point where in energy it had less to say and it needed to partner. Yeah, uh, the young companies in, in technology that were approaching energy, whether it was clean tech or oil and gas, and the venture capitalists behind them were finally beginning to figure out what real scale means. And the valley does not understand scale. Yeah, uh, to me that's pretty exciting because I've seen both worlds. We have a speed gene out here. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, that, that is just is missing from the oil patch. In the oil patch, we're about how do you get it so big that it crushes everything. Yeah, in the shale gas world, where we've seen onshore in the U.S. a lot of this growth in production. Yeah, there's a bit of a speed gene coming back, but roll forward 20 or 30 years, we will not be running oil companies in 2030 the way we're running them now. You can't, they're not smart enough, right? The resource is getting more expensive, you have to be faster and cheaper at it. Yeah, you've got to get, um, for example, what uh, we refer to as uh, you know, NPD, the non-productive time, in the drilling process, out. Why does it take so long to bring a well online? Every day is, is money. These big drill ships cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. Yeah, but let's put uh, the, the rest of scale into perspective. If you go through the list of the top supercomputers in the world, who do you think the corporates are that own them? There's National Lab, National Lab University, National Lab Oil Company, Oil Company, National Lab University, run the list, yeah? Why? Because when you think big data, you think in yeah, uh, orders of magnitude less than we do, right? Um, those uh, that uh, understanding the subsurface that's been mentioned a couple of times here, yeah, we're basically taking a picture, something you can't really see, and it's not a very good picture, and you know, give you a, an idea of perspective of what that means. You run a seismic shoot, you spend tens of millions of dollars collecting data, yeah, with these you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a day ships out in, in, the, uh, uh, in the deep water ocean, and it takes you six months even to see what the picture looks like. Why does it take six months to develop the picture? Yeah, because the data sets that, uh, and, and these guys know this a lot better than I do, they've been in the business longer than I have, but the data sets they're dealing with are just so massive. Yeah, getting a better picture there gives us an ability to yeah, find the oil faster, gives us an ability, because frankly you can make a better decision quicker, it gives you the ability to extract more, it, gives, it reduces that uncertainty that's been, that's been mentioned a couple of times. So then once you've found the stuff, now the question is it, it's flowing. So what do you do with it? Yeah? What changes do you make to your, essentially your production plant, this, 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 uh, this field and reservoir? Well, you need to know something about it. So the next kind of big thing for, you know, for IoT and big data is we need to meter the living hell out of this thing. Yeah, we need to see every single point, what's happening where. However, the cost per point has to be dirt cheap, and it's got to be really easy to get it down you know, in 3,000 meters of water, yeah, and then get it, get it down thousands of more meters underneath that, yeah, below salt, yeah, in really nasty things that we don't understand very well because we don't have a very good picture. Yeah, it can't break because it costs us millions of dollars just to touch it. Yeah, then we need that data back and we need it to go somewhere, to some sort of systems, and then we need to go to some sort of operating systems and some sort of applications on top of that feed into some sort of workflow for the 90,000 Shell employees and half a million contractors that we have working, which is matched by BP. They're about the same size as us. Yeah. Neil, what about the deltas between Silicon Valley and Houston? Oh, it's real simple. Y'all don't have any idea what we do. We need you to learn what we do so you can build what we need. All right. So. These guys are here to help that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Ricardo, let's take what just Neil so, said. So, so let, me, let me add one, one thing, actually, is that we, we think that there are quite a bit of technologies that we can borrow from telecommunication to oil and gas in the short term, right? So there are new problems that you need to solve, but actually there are existing solutions that we need to adopt to, to our own environment. All right. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, um, I, I, want, I have a very, very specific question for you. You have, what he was talking about, the big data and, you know, advanced analytics. You have specific investments that you mentioned to me in that area. But the thing is, oil and gas just, it doesn't move at speed. 
And here, Silicon Valley has a speed. So nobody has talked about the speed. You, know, you mentioned the speed, but the speed difference, you know, how are you taking those investments and making them successful is a question. <clears throat> so that's, that's, a, that's a great question in terms of adoption cycle. Yep. Right? That's, yep. that's a, uh, um, you know, if you think about uh, 3D imaging, uh, it has been around for a while. It took 30 years for oil and gas to actually get 50% penetration into the market. So that, that's, that's not very quick, right? Um, These guys are going to leave if it's five to seven years. They're gone. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And so the, I do think that that's changing over time. It's changing over time because of the need for technology and the cost of technology, right? And so Neil put together a couple of extreme scenarios in terms of the technology that you need when you are, you know, 10,000 feet beyond, below water um, and uh, offshore, right? But, but there are right now thousands, tens of thousands of wells right now in Texas that have no monitoring capabilities at all, right? Where you actually figure out that the well is not producing because every other week somebody drives by and say, well, shoot, the pump stop working. <laughs> right? And so, okay, so, so, <laughs> so those things happen every day, every day, everywhere, right? And so yeah. as technologies develop, as some of these sensors actually become cheaper, connectivity becomes even cheaper, networks begin to increase, a lot of these very simple technologies are going to be able to be utilized to be able to improve production by, you know, you don't have to get to 10% improvement in production. You have to get to like 3 to 5% okay. production. So in Silicon Valley terms, what are some of those things that you are looking at? You specifically talked about 1% to 3% increase if, if from the, for in production optimization. So what would be an area that you would go into? So, so a couple of things, right? Um, there, there are a number of different areas. One of the examples that actually you and I talked about was enhanced oil recovery down in Southern California. And so in Southern California, Chevron is big and you have another 10 companies that have been pumping oil out of San Joaquin for the, for the last 100 plus years. And so every day, every day, you inject over 500, I'm sorry, every, every year you invest over $500 million in natural gas to be able to create steam, to be able to continue producing wow. those, 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 mm. uh, those reservoirs. And right now, you don't really understand, right? Some people are better at this than others, but you don't really understand the relationship between how much you pump in one well in terms of temperature, pressure, and, uh, and, and other properties of the steam in some, in some places to be able to produce how much in other wells. And so if you're able to better understand what's happening down hole in the reservoir through imaging technologies, through data analytics, through AI and other technologies, you will be able to, to Instrumenting, get. measurements, and then applying that. Okay, right. well, well, let, me, let me come to you, Shantanu. Shantanu, the thing is, uh, if I look at your portfolio and just had an opportunity to look at it very, very closely, did not see advanced data analytics as the core part. I noticed that uh, the portfolio had companies which are more equipment and a service around it, material science, chemistry. So you're here in the Valley, you, uh, your own company was associated with it. Is there a change coming in energy venture? Sure, I mean, I guess uh, you have not looked at close enough. Uh, we have been investing in a lot of data companies right from the start. Our first fund had three uh, software companies in it and uh, currently in our newest right. fund, our first investment is actually exploration data analytics company. So we are very much on the data side and uh, I think uh, you're absolutely right. There is a, there, the energy industry is in flux right now. And why is it in flux? Because obviously, the, first of all, the economics macro is we talked about the oil price. But also there's a change of guard. The older generation, the 60, 65 year old guys are leaving the management. And the new guys who are 30, 35, 40 year old are taking charge. They are the ones who are making the decisions now. And these guys want everything on their mobile. They don't want to have the written report coming to them in the mail. They can't wait two weeks or five weeks. So the speed which Neil talked about is going to come to energy industry as well because there is a new generation taking charge. So that's a comforting factor for all of the Silicon Valley guys who are trying to come into the energy industry now. What you got to focus on though is um, things which are low hanging fruit because as I spoke to Sami, Taj Mahal was not built in a day. First you've got to build a minaret <laughs> and then only get a Taj Mahal, right? So uh, the challenge is in energy industry right now, even there's a lot of low hanging fruit. There, I, when I look at the sort of whole cloud, IoT, big data space, I see the problem, uh, there are three, three big buckets. There is the technology software, which is technology software for analyzing seismic, for analyzing petrophysics, for drilling, all these things. So that's one portion. Let's not, let's not focus on that. I think for Silicon Valley guys, there's a lot of other low-hanging fruit. 
So the other big bucket is business systems. We are still running, oil, small oil and gas companies are still running off Excel. They got to move to cloud. They got to get to that new business systems, which are very well adopted here in Silicon Valley, and just not there. Supply chain management is being done by Excel. Uh, uh, work, workflow management, people management, everything is on Excel and PowerPoint and Word. So they need to move on to the new business systems. The AFE control, the economics, everything is a lot of smaller companies, not the shells and the BPs, but these guys need new business systems. They need adoption. And how do you do adoption for them? You got to go in and sell to them individually. You can't just put it on a website and say, okay, come and get it. Mm. That's not going to work enough. So then the, third, then the third bucket is the one which we've been talking about is operational. This is around SCADA systems, sensors, data collection, around measuring the, uh, every, every little bit of the pipe, every little bit of the oil industry. So the two buckets, business systems and operational, are the ones which are going to be very easy, low-hanging fruits for Silicon Valley guys to really transition into. The measuring part is the IoT bit. Okay. And um, a lot of opportunity there. Well, now, Neil, did I understand it correctly? You said that Silicon Valley does not understand scale? Yeah. OK. Just, so. All right. So I just. <laughs> So, so I, give me an no, example no, no, of that. No, 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 my, my, my father-in-law lives here. Yeah, he um, worked for Tesoro, refiner, up in Martinez, not, not too terribly far away. When, when I met my wife, he, um, in order to date her, yeah, this is some number of years ago, he made me go to Martinez, sit in a 20-year-old pickup truck, and drive around that refinery in the middle of a turnaround to, quote, let me make sure I understood what half a billion dollars worth of steel looked like lying on the ground. Right. Okay. That's that, right. that's that's understood. Scale. Understood. Yeah. Uh, but between next, BP or next either one no, of us, no, no. we I produce just wanted to, I more just oil to. per day than most countries. Understood. Understood. Kamal, what is your next venture? Given what you have heard just now, you're sitting with the folks who are from the top five oil and gas companies, and you're sitting with a true Norway out of Norway. Venture Group, which has done some pro prolific stuff. You know all these guys. What are you going after? What is the biggest opportunity for you? You don't even have to go look for funding now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's why that's I'm asking the question. He said so, there is. We can't. Okay. I'll I'll give an example of one company. I've got ten yeah. portfolio companies okay. of Free Ventures. So one of them is called Seismos, and it touches both something that you talked about with Ricardo, which is the uh, steam flooding, but in this case, I'll talk about it's CO2 flooding that we're dealing with, and the it's uh, Silicon Valley. Technology. So the technology came out of Lawrence Berkeley Labs. It is um, low frequency seismic that can be shot from well to well. So the low frequency seismic travels along the boundary layer within uh, reservoir rocks. And the first application we're using it for is to characterize where. Okay, so CO2 flood is you, you inject CO2 uh, at a set of injector wells and you're producing oil uh, or gas, a mixture of oil and gas, out of a bunch of other wells. Problem is, you don't know where the CO2 is, just like you don't know where the steam is. So these low frequency waves, we can analyze them and determine where the CO2 fronts are, how it's propagating, and then optimize, what we want to get to is optimizing the injection pattern to optimize production. Hugely impactful, multiple percentage, we're thinking uh, on the order of 10% production rate increase, which is a lot, because single digit production uh, increases are, are impactful. Okay. Well, so just quickly, the 10, 10 companies, uh, what, what sectors? Just really quick. So this was? Okay, so this one is, is subsurface, got seismic, you can call what it. What else? Okay, another one. Uh, is an, uh, I've got another one that's seismic, and it's interpreting seismic data for what, geomechanics. Okay. Then another one is drilling technology and equipment. Another one is oil and gas accounting software. Another one's oil and gas accounting so services. So I, I, I'm hearing yeah. data. Data, Lots of data, data, data software, all, software all enabled services. All right. yeah. Now, this, this was very interesting. Um, Neil and Isam came yesterday, so I bought them a couple of beverages. I happened to walk away. I come in, and they were having, literally, I thought I had to break them apart here. That, and they were talking about some investment they had done. So with that, what I want to do is, I want to talk, I want, Neil, I want to hand it to you, and Isam, please jump in. I want you to touch upon what does an investment mean from your perspective? How do you compete? And what is the disagreement that you can come in? And then I'm going to hand it to Ricardo, because I want to find out if he agrees or disagrees with that. So g give you guys a little perspective. The, um, uh, the first deal we did in oil and gas on this new fund in Stevie, and Stevie's been around for 15 years, but the new fund's only a couple of years old now, was an um, ocean bottom seismic company out of Norway. Uh, 
this is a, basically a, a four-year-old company or so. Yeah, team had done seismic companies, yeah, dating back 20 years. It's been there once, doing it again, team. Yeah, uh, the technology is take a seismic node, which is basically a sensor, yeah, uh, put an atomic clock in it, yeah, a miniature atomic clock out of Boston, yeah, uh, yeah, put a battery in it, and stick it down, yeah, in 3,000 meters of water so you can get a better, better picture. And um, to, to understand the, the prize here, yeah, this company did more than 50 million in its first year revenues, right? The first contract was a $50 million contract from Stedwell. Yeah, before they had anything in the water had proven anything. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just amazing. I have never in my entire life had or been involved with a startup that managed to do that and make money in its first year like that. That's what the oil patch can do. In order to bring that to market, they have an engineering team from hell. It is the, the number of disciplines involved. We literally have a robotics platform, yeah, an automated manufacturing platform on shipboard to handle the thousands of nodes as they go in a reel-to-reel -reel system. They have, yeah, a, uh, there's, a, there's an, um, uh, yeah, an eight server, uh, server farm, box server farm on the shipboard just to collect the data. Yeah, there is an embedded software package. There's power electronics, power management. I mean, they've got atomic clocks there. This company was the first real purchaser of miniature atomic clocks. And that's just to get a single service into the water, right? Neil, the, this company, wh who, was, who funded it? How did they get that first? Uh, the two founders sold the business off to um, one of our service companies for several hundred million dollars and plowed about 10 million of their own money into it. Uh, then went and uh, raised money from a series of, uh, of angels okay. in Norway. We came in like fourth round. Okay, so the reason is about Islam. One of the things that you highlighted to me is one of the reasons that you exist is to ease the deployment of technology to find that strategic value and then walk it through into the company. So if you could touch upon that a little bit, because here is one example where that may have been case partially, but is that going to continue to remain to be the case? So let me comment for a minute on what uh, Neil said, and then I'll give you a specific example. Uh, so the, the comment is, and again, this is something that may be useful for you, is that when you see a number of uh, companies, oil companies who are working uh, on, on a specific technology, in most cases, we are really after a product that serves the industry and not serves the company. So this is something that is important for you to know because we're not talking about exclusivity, we're not talking about a small market segment. If you, if you basically manage to de-risk it in one of these major operators, then the others will follow suit immediately. So that's, that's where scale might be really, it will have a much slower slope at the beginning, but then when it takes off, it really takes off, and the revenues that you will see will, will be what, what Neil men, men, men mentioned there. But let, let me give you an, an example of what do we mean by, by deployment. So this is a technology, it's a, the acoustic telemetry uh, tooling that basically helps us see what is going on at you know, 20,000 feet below ground, measure temperature, pressure, strain, find out what is the fluid composition and, and things of that sort. Uh, when we looked at this company about two years ago, uh, they were doing one application that we thought is never going to generate even enough revenue to uh, justify using that technology. So we helped that company move from application A to application B and we were the first user of that application. So you can imagine, this is a company that is probably 50, 60, 70 million dollar in valuation, zero revenue, and it's going into two, three billion dollar asset in the Gulf of Mexico, right? So you can imagine how difficult it is really to sell a story to an asset manager who does not want to be part of any of this new stuff, right? So a lot of you know begging and you know arm twisting and you know, door slammed in your <laughs> face and stuff like that. But finally you managed to do it. And actually when you do it, and you know it, it was a successful trial actually, and BP was extremely happy with it uh, to the extent that actually the next set of tools went to one, one of our competitors. And as we're speaking now, they're doing the second trial in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. Just to give you an idea about this, this, when we talk about strategic value, each time BP is using this, we're saving between 20 to $30 million. This is each time. 
So okay. if we do it three times, 60, 70 million, just, so, just pay. So that, that's a critical comment because the other end of scale is we have a ton of applications that, that are basically low volume, high mix. We need 10 of them very specialized, and they're worth a fortune to us. And, and to give you an example, so MagSize is one, basically a sensor company that needs a massive amount of kit just to deliver the sensors. We've got another internal technology that we developed, and I'm a little mad because y'all didn't develop it and bring it to us, or bring it to Baker to sell it to us. Um, yeah, and it's basically a valve that sits on our platforms. It's called Smart Choke. Yeah, um, we've published some stuff on this. You can go take a quick look. And, and all it really is is some sensors and some algorithms and a valve. It's a smart valve to solve a particular problem yeah, that, uh, yeah, called slug control that happens in platforms all over the world. This has uh, been a, invented in Shell a, a number of years ago. This is the type of thing. It's, it's, that's how it, it's a sensor, algorithm, valve. Baker's got valves. Baker understands valves. They understand algorithms. So does yeah, um, the, the, the uh, uh, rest of the oil patch. Yeah, we need Silicon Valley partnering with the guys in our supply chain to figure out these problems and bring them to market. We well, need, thank we you need very much partner. for pitching Baker there. Now, Ric I, I try <laughs> very hard to pitch Baker. Yeah, I know you, you're saying. <laughs> so, Ricardo, you heard Shell, you heard BP, <laughs> GE Persuade. Now, the thing is, GE is partnered, though, the, you're managing director on a fund which is NRG Energy and ConocoPhillips right. also. So, your perspective on the same yeah, thing. So, so it's a. Um, so one of the reasons why, why we actually put together energy technology ventures was to actually expedite this deployment of technology to the field, right? And so within GE, what we do is we help, we help productize technology and get it to market. And so when we see a, a new startup company, we, we obviously we evaluate it, we test it, as it were, uh, how can we help it actually get it to market? And then the idea was to then work with ConocoPhillips, for example, to be able to then get a first customer to try this in the field. And that's huge, right? Excellent. And so it takes a while sometimes, on the downside, it takes a while for the oil and gas uh, industry to adopt something. And, and uh, that's, that's unfortunate, right? That's just the, the nature of the beast. Now, having said that, once it gets adopted and it becomes a, an industry standard, pretty much any segment of the market is a billion dollar business. And you can make a huge, huge business out of it. So Ty's next uh, billion dollar babies will be coming from oil and gas. Uh, just one second. Ricardo, starting with you, range of your investment. What is the normal range and what is mean max? Two to $10 million is the normal range. Uh, highest has been $69 million. Okay, fantastic. Shantanu, you? Five to 50, and highest uh, is around 50, actually. All right. yeah. So two to five, lowest is quarter of a million in a very, very early startup, and biggest is 24. 50,000 to a few million. Fantastic. Uh, one to 10 for the first check. All right, it didn't used to be this far down. Now they're moving further and further upstream in the startup cycle because they realize that they can nurture and mature something a lot faster and engage it more quicker. So the cycle time, if I'm not incorrect, has you, because of you guys, has dropped in of adoption from like, used to be a decade, and then that software would last for 25 years and no changes are made, to now we are looking at sometimes two to five year range would be it. All right, so quick, very rapid fire questions for you guys. Uh, I want to start with Ricardo. Ricardo, an entrepreneur comes to you. You always see all of these pitches. What is it that you don't want them to tell you? What is it that they want? They don't want, they don't want no, no. What is it that you don't want to hear from them? I want to hear from them what, what, uh, what so what I don't want them to ask me. Uh -huh is what am I looking for, right? I, okay. I want them to tell me. <laughs> really? Okay. Good, good. Next. Shantanu. They should not badmouth their competition. They should show us clear uh, differentiation, but do not badmouth it because that really? just shows. Are you kidding? Yeah. No, just kidding. All right, good. For God's sakes, don't tell me how big the market is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? You don't want them to tell you how, about your own business? Is that it? Really? <laughs> All right. I want a realistic uh, forecast of revenue growth, not pie in the sky. You never yeah, get it. It's, it's, it's on, yeah. That's a dream. You will never get that. <laughs> I'm, I'm usually disappointed. But, but that, so that, that's an interesting question, right? Because if you see the realistic growth of a company, would you invest in it? <laughs> <laughs> I'd have a lot more very, trust in the leadership. Good. Very good question. The problem is you, you, will, you will go and discount it if they show you realistic growth. And then they will be sitting at a lower valuation of that. So the re uh, realistic uh, growth. Uh, uh, MBA schools have a purpose. Come on, don't dish that purpose. Come on, <laughs> Neil. So a uh, comment of Assam's from uh, from yesterday: you, you Don't tell us our business. We need you to understand 
yeah, uh, what we're dealing with before you show up. And if that means you need help to find the people, fine, we can help with that. But don't come in and try and explain a problem where yeah. the granularity, the devil's in the details, and you're giving us a generalization, because we'll hand you over to our scientists and engineers, and, and their eyes will glaze over. And then that, I'm done, I can't invest. That, that's a great point, right? So something that they should actually focus on is to, to, to make sure that it's clear that to show what they know and what they don't know, right? And so I've been working with a couple of software companies and I've seen you know, 100, north of 100 in this space. There have been a couple of them that they know exactly what they do mm. well. They know okay. about their software, they know about their algorithms. They have no idea about oil and gas. They can pick up some really strong expertise from having some key mm. folks that have spent 40 years in the field. And so knowing what you know well Focus on that, and then you know, make sure that you you you, you get complementary okay. capabilities. Let, let, let me summarize it, and I won't call out names here. First of all, you know, in the, in the PowerPoint, the three pages out of the seven, you just took him out because it was all about it's a trillion dollar business I'm going after. I won't even get any of it, but uh, I will tell you about it. Second thing, tell me what you know, don't tell me what I know. So we did that. So this is this is fascinating. I like that. All right, next one. This is rapid fire again. Uh, you have. Now, I want the answer to be very quantitative. I want you to tell me if you have $2 million to invest, exactly what area, and let's please make it pertinent to Silicon Valley, what area you will invest in, Ricardo? Data analytics. Okay, data analytics. Shantru, hold on, Shantru. What would you not invest in? Predictive analytics. You will not invest in predictive <laughs> analytics. You will not invest in predictive analytics. Oh, 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 this and is I'll good. tell you the reason. Yes. You need to have data and you need to have you need to be used to analytics before you can get to predictive analytics. The problem is oil and gas is so far behind. We are not even doing analytics. We don't even dash we don't even have <laughs> dashboards to see how much production is coming, how much how much problems, what the what supply chain is doing. What will you do with predictive analytics in a very small corner when you don't even have analytics on your whole asset? You gotta do the first three years, the next three years are for analytics. And then after that, three years after that is predictive analytics. All right, you guys did not expect that one. All right, Issam, what would you invest in? Two millions, very specific. Uh, Downhole sensors. Ah, very interesting. Kamal, what would you not invest in? Um. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's switching up one yeah, right after. You should have figured this pattern by now. I, 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 think I mean, get the predictive <laughs> analytics going here. <laughs> I'm not a linear <laughs> regression. I'm very uh, non-linear. Oil and gas ERP software and operation software because I'm already in the monster that's going to take over the world. Oh, really? Okay, good. What are you, Neil, investing in? Two million, very specific. Am I or what would I? No, what, what would you if you had two million? Uh, Especially speaking to this crowd, I, I think we stay at the application level, layer. I think it's that the workflow pieces that just hasn't been done in Houston. Basic SaaS stuff hasn't met the oil patch yet. So, so specifically talking to this crowd, how about specifically talking to any crowd? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, are you Production stoked? improvement. No, just kidding. <laughs> production improvement. Yeah, the, I mean, the quickest way to sell an oil company is show me more barrels. We, we've got teams, our deployment teams, their KPI, it's not dollars, it's not you know, yeah, um, uh, instances it's of deployment, it's you know, a barrel per day target. You show them a barrel per day improvement that they can sell to their boss, they will buy it so fast and spend so much money on it, your head will spin, assuming you don't break something along the way. <laughs> so, so the, the reason this is important actually is, I mean, if you look at what BP pr pr basically produces every day and assume that using this digital technology you can have an improvement of let's say one, one and a half percent uh, uh, of production, that translates to a billion dollar per year opportunity. It's, it's really that big. So Sammy, it may be useful to explain to people what a decline curve is, because I'm not sure yeah, the depletion business is understood here. All right, the thing is, we have eight minutes. Please just, <laughs> if, if, what, what I would like you to do is, please talk about what is the implication of it, and these guys will go learn. So, um, the oil and gas business is an NPV business. It's a cash flow business. Well comes on and well produces less every day till the end of time. That's not strictly true, but it's basically a curve. It's a decline curve, right? If you flatten that curve, the NPV value of the well goes through the roof. And there's lots of ways to do it. If you bring, the, if you bring production forward, NPV value can go through the roof, depending on how much you spend to do it. So when, when we say, you know, improve these things, right, there's basically a known or 
theoretically known amount of oil on the ground, and there's a known amount we can get out, and a time curve and a cost against that. You either need to reduce our cost to find it, reduce our cost to get it out, or you know, flatten the, the curve, get it this out This is the final measurement in that PowerPoint. Yes. Absolutely. Perfect. Kamal, you are agreeing. Yes, and a big problem is that the decline curve is created by a petroleum engineer, and they're terrible at it. So oh, over the great. last couple of years, we took a technology from Berkeley again that uses big data analytics, big sets of production history data, and automatically generates decline curves that are very, very accurate, way more accurate statistically than a person can. Fantastic. One of the things that, if you notice, Kamal is doing some stuff with machine learning and predictive analytics, but as soon as he heard Shantanu, he has not used the word predictive <laughs> all, this, all this time. <laughs> All right, folks, so um, we're coming to a close, and one of the things I would, again, I want to encourage, I want to make it a call to action, please engage with Ty Houston's Energy SIG and Ty Silicon Valley. Reach out to me if I can be of any service to you. I am the director for Palo Alto Innovation Center, and I am also the director for Enterprise Data Analytics, and I'd remove the word predictive from that one, too. All right, we have five minutes, and I, has, I had requested you, I need a 30-second close. I hope you guys had a chance to think through it. We'll start with you. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Isam, we're going to start with you. That 30-second close, what, you know, for looking out at BP's future, specifically what you're thinking about doing, how do these people engage with you? How do you want to engage with them? And anything which is the very, very, you know, it's not insight, it's foresight that they can use. Insights are easy. Foresight is something that only comes from experience. Please. Know that the technology actually, the, the industry is moving from the old model, which is develop everything inside. So there is more and more that's being oh, done on the outside, good. and that's what means is for groups like my team, there's more and more work and opportunity to interact with you. So that's, that's number one. Number two, very specifically, what we're looking for are, are, are applications in in digitization, in visualization, data analytics, in robotics, you know, anything again that will reduce downtime is going to be incredibly important for us, and, and robotics can, can do a lot, a, a lot of that. The final area that we're interested in, that we're looking into investing in, is cyber technology. Fantastic. Cyber security. Kamal. Uh, it's important to understand the technology adoption cycle in oil and gas. So it's a fast follower market, which means that the first three implementations are going to take forever. They're going to take a lot of capital, a lot of time, and a lot of effort and focus on your part. And then once you've done that and proved it out, you're going to get a flood of business. So you need to understand the way these well, What is the, the patience requirement on the entrepreneur side? You know, what are we talking about here? Just to it's, set it's expectations. It's sort of like Mother Teresa. Oh, patience. Oh, sure. Good luck. Is that uh, what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. It's going to take longer than you think, and then it's going to happen much faster than you thought it would because okay. of all that okay. suffering. You that that hockey stick really is real in the, in the oil right. patch business. Yeah, but you, Neil, you have the mic. Please go ahead. Take your 30 seconds. I'm, I'm taking my turn. All right. <laughs> Look, we're not going to run the oil field in 2030 the way we run it today. Yeah, the, uh, the technology that will power it has not yet been built or designed. We certainly haven't adopted it. And, and this is literally the biggest market that any of you guys have ever seen. All right, thank you. And then Shantanu, please. Sure, um, and I'll just uh, add to the, the comments here by mentioning that this is a global industry and you need a global partner to be able to do it. You need somebody who can actually access the massive markets in Norway and Aberdeen and UK and, and Middle East. And so, I mean, these big companies are good partners, but also an independent uh, capital provider who can help you do that or advisor who can help you do that is very much required because uh, maybe the right buyer for your technology is not here. Maybe it's uh, very far away from here. So you got to think about that. Thank you. And Ricardo. A couple of quick things. Number one, I totally agree with Isam's comment in terms of GE being open for to open innovation, right? Within GE, we have the strong capabilities. We have thousands of PhDs in R&D. Uh, we clearly only do part of, uh, we only see part of the technology through them. And so by working with, with the GE Ventures, what we're trying to do is to be really, uh, to, to be a channel to access technology that we, only, we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. So Venture Capital Group is just one of the channels. We're trying to work more and work with entrepreneurs uh, to form joint ventures to look at new, not only new technologies and new solutions, but new business models. And, uh, and so, you know, we're looking for great technologies, not only, only on, the, on the oil patch, 
Um, I think that's part of the solution. Um, digital oil field is going to be uh, definitely evolving in the next 10 to 20 years. I thought that with, with Neil's comment in terms of in 30 years, the, the, the way we operate fields are going to be completely different. Anom uh, automation, uh, analytics, um, this is something that we're looking into. So let me go ahead and uh, summarize very quickly. First of all, I did receive quite a few questions. I've tried to incorporate them, but I know I have not answered or gotten the answers for them. So please come up. The, our panelists are being very kind. They're going to be sticking around to take uh, your Q&A and speak with you. So in summary, the opportunity in oil and gas is huge is a small word. It's significant. Uh, Silicon Valley has an opportunity to be part of this technology, incorporation, creation with an oil and gas. We have the right people here, and we hope that you will continue to engage with us and let us know how we can help you. With that, panelists, I thank you very, very much for your very engaging comments, Q&A. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Ricardo. Ricardo.